Bonjour tout le monde. Good afternoon everybody. I'm Tim. I'm based out of Belgium. And in my day job, I run, I work at Akamai as a performance specialist team. And in the evening, when my wife falls asleep in front of the television, I also run the largest scale modeling website in the world. Not only the largest one, but also the fastest, which I will come back later. And on a daily basis, I use real user monitoring for my large customers trying to improve performance, but also on my website. And I really love real user monitoring. Why? Because it tells me how my end users perceive the website. No matter which browser they use, no matter where they are in the world, if they have a fast device, a slow device, bad connection, good connection, it gives me real-time insights. And I really, really love it. Something else I love is my two daughters, seven years and nine years old. Now, Rum and my daughters have two things in common, one thing in common. They can be very, very noisy. And with my daughters, the solution was very simple. I just bought some noise-canceling headphones. I'm too far away from the slides. I just bought, oops, no, it's... Uh, like this. I bought these noise-canceling headphones, especially during COVID, pendant le confinement. This was great to stay insane. And that's a great solution for my daughters, but for Rum, I came up with a new solution called noise cancelling Rum. And if you implement these techniques, you will have a few benefits. You'll see A, less fluctuations on your Rum data. Secondly, when you make a change, a performance improvement, it will be easier to spot changes. Three, is when you analyze your RUM data, it will also be easier to find the actual bottlenecks and you will lose less time trying to fix something which you might not fix. And then last but not least, it will allow you to better correlate your business metrics with your actual technical performance. So I will now share some techniques to get there. And you can apply this technique to any RUM solution. I work for Akamai, we use Ampels, but you, you use Dynatrace, in theory you can apply this technique to any solution. This graph, this is a graph which makes a lot of us happy. You have performance, you do a deployment and performance improves. Awesome, everybody happy. But more frequently than you want, in RUM you might see something like this, where you do see a change, so you can see, hey, the glass is half full, but you can also say, hey, the glass is half empty because it's actually not as big as you hoped. Or even worse, you made a change and you see nothing at all. Sounds familiar? A few yeses, that's good, thank you for that. Now, this gap between how much you actually see in RUM depends on a few things. First is the impact. If you make a change which changes a micro-tuning, let's say removing one CSS rule, like I do sometimes in the evening, will that make a big difference? No. So of course, the bigger the change, the easier to see it. That's of course one thing. But making a big change in RUM does not necessarily mean that you see it. Because there is something which I call the reach. In synthetic, if you make a change and you do 100 tests, you will see that change on all, your, on all your measurements. In RUM, that's not always true. Think about many optimizations only apply to the landing page and not to the second, to the third, fourth, fifth page view. So on my website, the average session length is five pages. If I improve, the, if I change TLS from 1.2 to 1.3, I make the TLS connection faster, awesome, but you will only see it on 20% of the pages. And then the zone, what do I mean with that, is where, if you're looking at the performance histogram, where the change you did, where is it actually impacting? Is it impacting everybody or is it more improving the faster, the fastest performance and making that even faster or is it more something to make the slowest performances faster? So that's the zone. And then the last thing is, uh, uh, 
it's, I will do it like this. The last thing is percentiles. Is which percentile you look at will also depend on if you actually see a difference. And the problem there is, in my view, in the performance world, we have this single performance fetish. In the past, it was median. Now with Core Web Vitals, it's a 75th percentile, which is, in the end, okay. I agree, if you, have, if you need to talk to the business, a single percentile is great. But if you need to do an analysis, performance analysis as an engineer, I don't advise to look at single, at single percentiles. To give you an example, this is performance, time to first byte over time. And what you see here is, in case there is a CDN hit, the fastest performance is actually quite good. That's the 10th and the 25th percentile. And in case it's a cache miss, you need to go to the origin. The origin is slow, the origin is far away. You have a slower performance. Now, let's suppose we make some changes at the CDN and we improve, increase the TTL. So, and we go from 63, we now have 63% edge hits. What does it mean? In this case, the median has improved quite a lot because rather than going to the origin, you now serve it from cache. The 75th percentile, a little bit. And the worst case scenario, you don't even see it at all. I've had customers who look, oh, we look at the 95th percentile. That's the only thing we look at. They make a change, this change, they wouldn't have seen a difference at all, which makes sense. Is this still a good change? Yes, it's still a good change. Is it the perfect change? If they want to improve the 95th percentile, no. But they can now, based on this, they can still make some uh, decisions. So first best practice is take away from this talk, always, when you analyze data, always look at multiple percentiles. Don't just pick one because you will be blind for a lot of interesting data. And the next thing is when you're looking at RUM data, we don't cancel out our noise. We just grab all the noise and include it in our analysis and that's a problem. And my advice here, the short version of this talk, is focus on a concept I call human visible <coughs> navigations, which means everything is, which is not human, filter it out. Everything which is not visible, filter it out. And everything which is not a navigation, filter it out. That's the basic talk. Now, this noise is quite big. 22%, if you combine these three numbers together, is noise. So I, when I do an analysis on my website, I filter out, I only look at these human visible navigations and the rest I filter out. Now, I already mentioned a few times my website. Just so you know, it's not the largest website in the world. It's the largest scale modeling website in the world, but scale modeling is not the coolest hobby on this planet. I know that. Um, so, but I still have 40K visits a day and 6 million pages. So the data I will share is, let's say, it's not like a small blog post with 20 views a day. So the data I share is still representable. And if you don't know what scale modeling is, there is a brand called Heller, which is a French brand. I don't know if you know that, but we basically start with plus tickets like these, we glue them together, we paint them together, we spend weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and in my case, even years detailing them, and then you get like a completely nice model. Now, it's also the fastest scale modeling website in the world. So here you see Trio, who knows Trio, which is, yes. So that, that uses the uh, Crux data set and it allows you to easily visualize. It's a free tool, I, there is a paid version, but this comes from the free tool. So this is from my website. Largest contentful paint, 0 0.7 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. I will pay you $20 later on. <laughs> um, so that's what I, what I do. Now, in order to get there, I had to tweak a lot and tune a lot. And this is also how I came to the concept. So human visible navigations. Let's start at the back. Navigations. If in your browser console, you type this data and you get the entry type. 
you get either navigate, you either get navigate, you either get back forward, or you get reload. Navigate is, you click on the link, that's navigate. You click on the link, that's navigate. When you hit the back button, that's back forward. When you hit the refresh button, that's reload. So what I'm saying is on my website, I only look at 85% whenever I do analysis because the rest is noise. And on the next slide, you will instantly see why that is. This is the waiting time. So waiting time is time to first byte without DNS, without TCP, without SSL handshake, without redirects, the pure, you send the get request, how long does it take? Now what do you see? My, I don't remember what this is. Let's say, I think this is the median. 83 milliseconds, but if you're looking at the navigations, it's actually 96 milliseconds. And typically when we talk about performance, we look at when people are navigating to the website. How many of you have said, hey, we have a project to speed up the back forward navigations because if you click the back button, it's four milliseconds. Now what is the problem? This is 14% of the data. 14% ultra, ultra fast. It's enough noise to give you the impression that your site is actually faster than it is. So my advice, I always focus on this. And why does it matter? Especially around the reach. Suppose you make, you remember the CDN performance change we did earlier? improving the TTL. If you improve the cache at the CDN, or if you improve your database lookups at the origin, how fast, how will that have an impact on your back forward button? Zero impact. Why? Because it's loaded instantly from the browser. If you include all your navi back forward navigations in your analysis, you add 15% of data which you don't impact at all. And the more data you impact, the better you see the drop. The more noise you add, the less you see the drop. That's easy. And this especially has an impact if you're looking at the lower percentiles. If you're looking at the median 75th, then that 15% lightning fast request at the beginning basically push out your median and push out your um, 75th percentile. Now, this is not the only problem. It gets worse. The noise heavily depends on the page type you're looking at. What you see here on the home page, it's 8%. On the search, it's 23%. Now, what is the problem? What does it mean? This basically means that people who do a search on my website, they click on the result, they click back, and then the search page instantly loads, they click on the next result, and they do this like quite a lot. Because of this, 23% lightning fast search results measurements, this gave me the impression that my search was actually quite fast. And I never tuned it. Like, hey, my search was one of my fastest pages. I didn't have to tune it because it, the data said it was fast. The reality is if you re none of my users say, hey, Tim, when I click the back button, thank you very much for this four milliseconds time to first byte, they care about the actual searches. The second one is product detail pages, and I have a few kits. That's basically the basic, let's say, helicopter kit you buy. And then on my website, you can see related products, additional decal sets, conversion sets, without going to details. But you see here that the noise is different. Why is that? People search for this, and then they click on the related items, and then they go back, because this is the main thing interesting. And I spent hours and hours and hours in the evening while my wife was watching Grey's Anatomy, trying to tune the database queries because I thought that it was related to database that some queries were more complex than needed and the only result why the only reason why these aftermarket sets were slower than these was because they had less fast noise and this had a lot more noise makes sense so far 
Now, this is then the reload noise. This is when people hit the reload button. Main thing you need to know here again is it heavily depends on the page. And the main reason why I remove reloads is because who does typically reloads? The, de the developers. And, the, and that can, especially on a smaller site like me, when I develop a full evening, the amount of page use I add to RUM is quite heavy and then the reload can impact that data. But I hope that your website has more visitors than I have. Um, just as an example, final example, this is the search. Here you see the overall search, 93 milliseconds. If you're just looking at the navigation, you see not that many items in green, while the back forward, a huge amount of items is in green, and that indeed here results in making it look better than needed. Now, you might say, Tim, who cares about scale modeling websites? My website is completely different. I agree. Therefore, I also want to share some data from the RUM archive. Who has heard about RUM archive? Thank you. So RUM archive was introduced at We Love Speed, uh, not, not We Love Speed, Performance Now in Amsterdam last year. It's basically an open source project from Akamai. If you just go to that website and you use BigQuery, you can query aggregated RUM data from all Akamai and Pulse customers. You can't zoom on them specifically. Everything is aggregated. It's, everything is privacy friendly, but that can give you some additional insights. And my colleague Robin, he did this query for me. And here you see the overall, so this is not for my website, this is for all the millions and millions and millions of data points uh, of the RUM archive. You still see that the noise is in this case around 11 to 12%. So it's not significant. It's significant, sorry. Here you see a histogram, time to first buy it, and then the amount of beacons and what you see here, these back forward ones, the orange, they have quite a lot are sitting here in these lightning fast connections, last lightning fast performance. And this results in your median, your 75th percentile actually looking better than it is. So always focus on navigation type equals navigate. Next is visible. If in a browser you type the statement document.visibility state, you have two options. It either is visible or it's hidden. And many RUM tools like Ampulse, what do we do? We basically track, and Boom Open Source Boomerang as well, we track three variants. Always visible, what does it mean? You navigate it to a page on a specific tab, and while the page was loading, till the, uh, while it was completely loading, it was always in the front. Always hidden. For example, you do a search in Google, you click, right click, open a new tab. And while you're still on the Google page reading stuff, the page loads in the background. And you only go to that page when it's completely loaded. And then partially hidden, that is, you either the page started loading and for example, it took too long and you switch tabs or you said right click and before the page was fully loaded, you went to that page, these two things. And as you can see here, the noise is around 7%. Now, why do I say this is noise? Look at the performance data. So now we're looking at the largest contentful paint, one of the core web vitals. When it's always visible, 4.75 seconds. As soon as it's not visible, look at the performance. Why would this be? The browser prioritizes, wants to shave off as many milliseconds as possible for the stuff you're actually looking at. The moment your page loads in a different tab, the browser says, this is less important and therefore delays things network, memory, whatever is delayed. Now the result is very slow pages. Now for those of you who like to look at the higher percentiles, 95th percentile, etc., in theory you want to tune this 
but what you're actually looking at is this. Now, how many of you said, oh, we need to improve the performance of our website when it's loading in the background? Nobody. But if you look at all the data, this noise can really influence you. Now, in this, you can actually see 130 milliseconds difference on the, uh, so that's quite substantial. Also here, the main impact is um, the reach, not that much. It's a little, a little bit smaller, but mainly on the percentiles, this mainly impacts the 95th, 98th, 99th percentile, the higher percentiles you are looking at. Also here, the noise depends on the page you're looking at. Again, search in this case, only one and a half percent noise. Now, why does this generate a blind spot? Because this, again, makes the search page look faster than all the other pages. Because all these other pages have a lot of slow noise. Search, again, my RUM data says, hey, Tim, your search is quite fast. Because I had a lot of lightning fast noise in the beginning, and I have no slow noise at the end, so search was actually slower than the reality. And here the same, hours and hours raced it while Grey's Anatomy was running. Um, RUM data, here it really depends a bit on the website. Uh, so around 10% of noise there. And this is not as clear as with the uh, back forward navigations. <coughs> But if you look at the data, you actually see that the noise is more sitting at the end rather than the beginning. That brings us to the third point. We already had visible, we already had navigations, now we're looking at human. What I'm basically saying is everything which is not human, everything which is robot, we ignore. I don't care about the bad bots, I don't care about the cute bots, everything should be ignored. As an example, I have a lot of scrapers on my website. So on my website I have these live pricing information from many, many websites around the globe. And what, does, what do these online shops like to do? They like to scrape my website to check the prices and based on that make some dynamic things. If they do that, and I don't detect them, I really don't want them to screw my data. Why? Bots, they are typically in a fast, in a data center with a very well connected, with a very good connection, with very powerful machines, so they likely have a good performance. So they would, bots, and I don't care about the bots, they would make the, my RUM data they would add some noise. Another example, I have bots who try to steal the barcode information and they want to augment the data. Again, these bots, they come and go. That's the bad bots. What is the name of a good bot? Barry, that's for you. What is the name of Google bots? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Google bots. So on a monthly basis, on a 90 days basis, Google crawls my website 12 and a half million times. I love Google bots when they come to my website, but I don't want Google bots to pollute my RUM data. Because when I tune for performance, it's mainly tuning for the end users, not for the Google bot. Now, luckily, the Google bot does not execute. Google bot executes JavaScript, but will not send beacons. So, by default, Google bot is not visible in RUM. When you see Google bot visible in RUM, it's likely a fake bot pretending to be Google in the hope that they can steal the information for you. So that's one thing. Now, why do the bots matter? I already said it. They're a, they're a lot faster, typically. The other problem is they are not predictable. I know on, in the morning at 2 a.m. is the lowest performance. I, I have the least amount of visitors, and I have also the slowest 
time of the day. And that's also what Boris mentioned in his talk. On a, my Sunday is different than a Monday. And every week roughly looks the same. A bot doesn't care about Sundays and Mondays, and they visit you on an irregular basis, and that can really make data look strange. And what you're seeing here is CLS, cumulative layout shift, how many shifts there are on the page, and that's my favorite KPI to tune. And here, on one day, I made some changes to the website, deployed it the next day. I wanted to look at run data. I hope to see that graph going down. And I noted, ah, my CLS, it went up. And I didn't know why, so what do you do? CLS matters, roll back. So I rolled back and improved. Next day, it was fixed. Two days later, I did another deploy, nothing happened. And then I figured out, what is this? This was every three weeks, a bot from Germany came in and they used an old version of Chrome. And that old version of Chromium was, um, had issues with CLS. When you had like CSS containment, it was like an older browser. And regular users, only 0.05% would have that old version. When the bot arrived, suddenly you had 10,000 of additional requests for that old browser, and you had these flaky things. So key message is, although the total noise for bots is only 1% over time, on some times of the day, it could become 50%, and it's like very, very fluctuating. So by default, don't look at noise. Uh, don't look at bots. So, summary, human visible navigations. If it's not human, forget it. If it's not visible, forget it. If it's not navigations, forget it. Now, you might say, Tim, why do you even capture this data? Why do RUM tools even capture this data if you throw it away? Simple, sometimes the noise becomes the signal. Back forward navigations. Yes, for waiting time LCP, it's not relevant because it's fast. But for things like CLS, cumulative layout shift, a lot of your layout shifts actually happen when people click on the back button. So when I tune for CLS, I explicitly tune for the back forward navigation because I want that to be as stable as possible. So it's not always noise. The visibility state. Which pages, what would it mean, for example, if suddenly the percentage of requests being loaded in the background increases? it might mean that the perceived performance for your end users changed. Because if things are fast, you just click around. If you know that things are slow, what will you do? You will start saying right click, open a new tab, right click, open a new tab, right click, open a new tab. So if this percentage changes, or if this is higher than what the RUM archive says for you, it might, might be an indication for the perceived performance loading of your website. And then the bots. The bots are never a signal. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. Um, I think that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you very much. And are there any questions? I don't even know if we have time left for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the first question. Another $20. <laughs> uh, my question is about uh, partially hidden uh, data because we have figures about, uh, I think it was LCP, which, uh, which is worst when it's partially visible. And I don't expect this result because when it's fully hidden, it's faster.
Yeah, that's a great question. And I have, where is it? I think a little bit further. Here it is. Yeah. So basically you're asking why is partially, partially hidden should in theory be between this value and this value. Uh, yes, the reason I think is partially hidden on my website is only 0.01%. So it's like a very small percentage. So I think it's just, I, I think it's just has, doesn't have enough data to, um, to, uh, look at, to, to look at that. Yes, high margin of error. Yes, so that's the, that's, but yeah, in theory it should be between these two, I, uh, I agree. Yes, great question, thank you. Yeah, and if you have questions, you can feel, uh, tu peux, vous pouvez les demander en français aussi. Um, et je vais répondre en anglais. Mais... <laughs> Autre question? Ah, merci. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, when we took uh, the 75 percentile uh, within, uh, within the classical tools that we are using for the room, uh, does it um, filter uh, intelligently, I would say, uh, compared to what you just uh, presented us uh, regarding, uh, especially bots or things like that? Is this something that improves naturally because the, the filtered traffic, I would say, is the uh, abnormal one, or is this uh, the same when we filter? Yeah, no, great question. Um, so it depends. That's always a good. Uh, that's always a good answer. Uh, but I, what you will, I, you have on one hand noise in the beginning, uh, which is like lightning fast, and then you have some noise at the end, which slows things down, and they somehow cancel each other out. So the it's yeah. uh, some uh, the impact on especially on the 75th percentile is on one hand is increased and on the other hand is degraded I had one customer where and they said hey Tim awesome idea they implemented the same thing and they saw for the 75th percentile like a two milliseconds difference between uh, that now that was when you're looking at the total value if you're looking at individual page groups then the noise levels might really be different. Like for example, the search for those pages, the noise levels can become a lot bigger and then it, and not canceling out. But in general, if you're looking at the 75th percentile, it's far away from the outliers here and it's far away from the noise there. So from that perspective, it's a quite clean percentile if you don't apply this technique. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? If not, I'm always available at uh, downstairs during the breaks. And thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. <laughs>